Chapter 11 The dreams were back. Rob was in the middle of a crowd. He couldn't make anyone out. He was in a gray, foggy world with lazy smoke hanging in the air. He couldn't see his feet since his legs disappeared at his knees into the mist. There were people bustling and chattering all around him, but he could only make out abstract, shadowed figures. He felt a sense of calm even in such a bizarre place. Maybe he was aware that he was only in a dream. Something flew by behind him, smacking him in the back. He turned and only saw the disturbed smoke chasing after whatever it was that had hit him. Some of the fog had cleared away and he could vaguely make out some of the other people. They were just ordinary folks. No one was familiar. His eyes focused on a tall man with spiky dark hair who was talking on a telephone. The spiraling cord off of it disappeared into the haze. Suddenly a quick blur of a light brown trench coat and hat flew at the man and knocked him down into the mist. The blur and the man were then gone. Then Rob heard screaming followed by a loud ripping sound. Two droplets of blood hit him in the forehead. The sound stopped. Rob touched the droplets that were beginning to run. He examined his fingertips. They were dark red. He saw a girl in culottes walking a cocker spaniel be attacked just as quickly and blurrily from the other direction. Were they disappearing? Were their bodies still lying there beneath the mist? He realized he couldn't even tell if he was standing on solid ground or just floating in the realm. He heard the dog whimper and the girl scream and then silence after a few loud crunches and one deep, menacing laugh. A cheerleader who was in the middle of practicing a routine went down next. Her pom-poms flew up and then disappeared under the dry ice layer. He squinted his eyes trying to make out what was going on. The killer lifted his head and torso up out of the smoke and looked at Rob. The lower half of his face was smeared with blood and slowly dripping chunks. He grinned and his tiny, stubby teeth were so drastically white against the surrounding red. They also looked sharp, like a piranha. He lowered his head while continuing to make eye contact with Rob. His hat was completely shadowing his face. The crystal blue eyes that Rob had seen before were glowing a solid white, even whiter than his teeth. The man-thing was in a position to lunge. Rob turned to run but bumped into one of his monsters standing behind him. It loomed above him. It slowly arched its back in a predatory manner until they were face to non-face. Rob turned to run from this new dark gray menace and found he was standing between the monster and the killer. The killer's wide eyes were then bleeding into a bright red. The monster was suddenly gone in a blink. The crowd of people was gone. Rob and the stranger were alone. In a gravelly southern accent, he said to Rob, You know I can see you too, sport. Rob instantly awoke. He knew what it meant. We were both asleep, Rob told Sue on the couch. It was early afternoon. Sue and Michelle both had to go to work later on that night. Neither of them would have another day off for the next three nights. Michelle was off running errands. They needed groceries and Michelle said she had to cash her check from the diner. She would be back in time to pick up Sue so they could both begin their shifts. I'm scared, Sue, he said. He looked down and then back into her eyes and went on. Before, every time I could see him, he was awake. What if it's working both ways? What if I've been awake when he's been asleep? Maybe he can see through my eyes the same way. Granted, he'd mostly just end up watching a lot of reruns on Nick at night, but still, there's something else. She waited patiently. I think we're honing in on each other even more now. I know where he is, at least at the moment of the dream. I think he knows where I am too, and I'm not on the move all the time. I'm real easy to find. I don't think he's just randomly traveling. I think he's coming to L.A. For you? she asked. I think so. He didn't want to continue, but he was compelled to. Sue, everything's all jumbled up right now. There's the killer, there are the monsters. I don't know what parts I may just be putting in the dreams myself through my subconscious. I need to know exactly what's real and what isn't. I can't be distracted, and I think that right now I may be. The monsters have been getting a lot of attention from us, or at least the situation involving them has. I could just be inserting a separate childhood fear here. This guy is real and here all the time. My dreams about him are accurate, but the rest... Maybe some other killer or killers are killing the other people from all over randomly. I don't know. I haven't actually seen a real monster since I was ten. I had been having a dream the other night, and I didn't exactly see anything coming after me. Maybe I just freaked. Maybe they never were real, or if they are, they may not even be involved in all this. What are you talking about? I heard the noises. You weren't making them, were you? Before he could respond, she continued, For Christ's sake, what about the bed? When I get intensely scared, sometimes I can make things happen. Her patience was gone. What do you mean? She snapped. Sometimes I can do things. It's not anything I can ever control. 
I told you how I used to make the pictures fall and books fly off the shelves. I remember. I used to do other stuff, too. I could only do it when I was feeling extreme emotion. There was this kid in junior high. He used to mess with me all the time. I was clueless, admittedly. I had a layered Fantastic Sam's mullet cut with bangs. Sue's expression broke. A laugh came up her throat and out of her nose. She opened her mouth to let the rest of the hitching laugh out. Laugh at my pain. That's nice, he said, smiling. It's worse than you think. There were tube socks. Oh, no, she said through the laughter. Uh Uh-huh, and I didn't know that you weren't supposed to pull them up as high as they would go. Some of those babies were like thigh high. She laughed harder. Well, my legs would get cold from those little shorts. You know the kind with the two stripes going down each side that would divide at the little slits? He was pointing at the side of his leg, only a few inches south of his ass. What? he said innocently. They looked nice with my collared shirt with the little alligator on the left breast. It was either the little alligator or the little footprints. Her laughter was starting to subside. Oh, God, I remember those. Low-top Velcro shoes. Matching leggings and sweatbands. Ripped stonewashed jeans. Bangs that you could surf on. Wham. She laughed and tried to think of something else and then said, Okay, you win. Woohoo! He raised his arms in victory. Ow, oh, she said as she held her sore stomach. I haven't laughed that hard in forever. After a few breaths from both of them, the mood turned serious again, but more comfortably so. Go on, Sue said. You were talking about some kid in junior high? Oh yeah, I was just saying he used to mess with me. He would do stupid things like knock your books out of your hand in the hall between classes. You know, one of those. I know the type. Well, one day after school, as I was walking home, I saw him up ahead riding a skateboard in the street. I was suddenly so mad. It wasn't just him. My mom's boyfriend then was beating me with a belt and stuff, and all my anger just came together. I felt myself shudder hard, and I instantly felt better, but a second later, he was thrown off his board and into the street. He didn't exactly come to a soft landing. He got up crying, skin, knees, and elbows, and I laughed. Rob's brow furrowed. A few days later, he fell off his skateboard again. A Mack truck dragged him almost 50 feet. The skin on his arm and the right side of his face was ripped off. I had nothing to do with that, but for some reason I've always felt guilty about it. Well, you shouldn't. The principal came on the intercom and said that the kid had come out of his coma, that he had been in for two days, and that he was in good spirits. He was quite talkative for someone in intensive care. An hour later, the principal came back on and said that he had died. It was so quiet and uncomfortable in the classroom that I couldn't help it. I started giggling. I was in pain from trying to hold it in, and everyone was staring at me either in shock or anger. That's actually a normal reaction. It's how some people deal. There's even a Mary Tyler Moore episode about that. Oh yeah, the clown's funeral. It's weird, though, how people have a moment like that before dying sometimes. What moment? It's like a moment of clarity. My mom got Max for me about six months after her dog died. She, the dog, had these bloody tumors on her sides that we could never get rid of no matter how many times the vet cut them off. She had lived to be pretty old still. The day we finally had to have her put to sleep, her eyes had turned a glossy, bluish color. She was acting like a puppy again all that day, running around, getting into everything, even knocking breakfast off the table. She was a great Dane. When my mom would go into another room, the dog would turn its head to follow her through it. It was like she could see through walls. It was creepy how aware she was that day. I never liked to be left alone with her. She was always jealous of me. She never wanted me to take my mom's attention away from her. One time, she put my whole head in her mouth, held it there, and then let go just to show me she could do it. That day, however, she was really sweet to me. Later that day, she went down and never got back up. The same thing seemed to happen to that kid from junior high. It's a weird aspect of death. That is weird, but not to be rude. We were talking about... Well, I don't exactly know, but... Oh yeah, I derailed the train. I was just saying how sometimes I've done things. I knocked the kid down... You know I love music. It fills my soul and, uh, Rob, train. I know, it's still on track. Anyway, I love music and sometimes it would give me chills. Whenever that would happen, the music would warble and the tape would get eaten. I had several tape players, my stereo system, my boombox, the living room system, my Walkman. It would happen on all of them. It wasn't so bad when I switched to CD players. Sometimes they would skip a little, but that was all. How does that tie in? What has that got to do with the monsters, Sue asked, wondering. I'm saying that maybe I'm doing it. Maybe I filled your bedroom with that energy the other night. Maybe I somehow even managed to flip my bed. I don't know about that. Me neither, and that's exactly my point. Just because they're in my dreams and I believe I had a traumatic experience doesn't mean they're real. I need to know what I'm up against. I know they used to be a part of my life, but I'm not 
so sure about them anymore. My shrink when I was younger told me just to stand up and yell at them to go away. She was in way over her head. I mean, what a dumbass. I can't believe I even told her about them. My mom made me. Maybe there really is a way to confront this, though. How? How are you going to know for sure? You know the other day in the park? She nodded, and then her eyes widened, and she shook her head emphatically. I think you may have been onto something. I know it was just simple miscommunication, but I'm starting to think it's a good idea. Well, maybe not good, but at least worth looking into. Hell no. Please, Sue, I need this. Are you completely out of your fucking mind? Maybe just a little? I'm serious. So am I. Look, it'll be fine. I'll go into your room. My room? I'll shut the door, but not lock it. I'll turn off all the lights, then I'll call them, like I used to. Then what? She sounded a little pissed. She was. Then I'll see if they come. If they do, if there's any validity to this, I'll see if I can overcome the fear. I've always wondered, now that I'm an adult, if I can talk to them. Maybe my dreams just vilified them because of my fear. They never really did anything to hurt me. Maybe I just misunderstood my experiences with them. You are insane. Just from what you told me, I can tell you that is a really bad idea. You should listen to your fear. I know how it sounds. All right, forget the talking thing. That is stupid. I'll wait for them with my hand right by the light switch and my other hand on the doorknob. I'll be ready to run. I want you guys in the living room with all the lights on. I want you near the front door, and I want that door left open in case you need to run. If that's how it turns out, I promise I'll be right behind you two. It'll be fine. Right, she said sarcastically. It will be. Trust me. I need to try this, Sue. I can't sleep with you guys for the rest of my life. Sue just stared straight ahead. All right? He waited and then asked again. All right? All right, she yelled. He jumped back a little. Thank you, he said after a moment of silence. Oh, you're welcome, but if anything happens, I'm holding you responsible. Got it. You better. I mean it. If anything bad happens, I'll never forgive you. I won't let anything happen. I promise. I would never want you or Michelle to get hurt. I'm kind of more worried about you. I'll be so careful, I swear, to take every precaution. Okay, she said, easing up. When do you want to do this? Tonight. She took a deep breath. Tonight it is. Is after you guys get off work okay? Yeah, it'll give me something to look forward to, she joked. I don't want to force you with this, even though I kind of am. It's just that not being totally alone might help with this. If you're going to do this, even though I'd rather you not, and I know you, you will do it. I want to be there. Count me in. Count Michelle in, too. She's the seance queen. I know she'll want to be a part of it. Great. You'll see. It'll be fine. Better not be famous last words. I trust you, she said steadily. Soon after, she left for work. Rob sat in the living room and nervously watched TV while playing out the future scenario over and over in his head until they got home. 